I usually take on a tool build for one of a few reasons. It could be because I think it'll be fun, because I think I can make it better, or because I'm cheap. Well, maybe cheap is a strong word. I just don't like spending money on something I know I could make myself. And when that something costs a thousand bucks, you can bet your sweet bippy I'm going to take a swing at it first. Okay, yeah, I am cheap. But I also think this will be fun, so there's that. The real question is if I can make that something as good as the obscenely priced version. Or if I'll just end up spending several days making a useless turd. You've probably picked up on this already, but I'm making a live center. It's the bit that goes in the tailstock of a lathe for supporting long parts. But why am I doing this? Don't I already have multiple live centers? Yes, but I also now have multiple lathes. And all of these centers are a bit overqualified for the new one. Sure, this lathe has a lot of other problems to fix before I'll actually need a live center, but that's beside the point. I'll need one eventually, and I'm feeling inspired to build it now. There is one concession I'm going to make, though. This live center is expensive as balls because the bearings in it are expensive as balls. If I were to buy the exact bearings used in this, I would just be back where I started. So rather than an accuracy rating of ABEC 7, I've downgraded just a bit to ABEC 5, which still have a run out less than 4 microns without draining my wallet. These ball bearings are of the angular contact variety, so they can support both the axial and radial loads seen by a tailstock center. And there are three of them because more bearings is more gooder, of course. But it also increases the load capacity and life of the live center. The last little guy here at the end is a needle bearing that saves the main three bearings from seeing too much angular loading. Okay, enough yapping. I can explain as we go. Let's make this thing. The body is the most challenging, so we'll start there. I need all the features to be as concentric as possible, so these first cuts are really important. The outside diameter is going to be my main axis reference for everything else to come. This is also why I'm using 1144 stress proof steel. As I remove metal, it should resist warping, which would throw all that concentricity right in the trash. Along with straightness though, I'm also keeping an eye on the taper. It's a small amount, but will be a big problem with some of the tense accuracies I'm aiming for. So a lick with a dead blow nudges the tailstock into alignment. You're going to see the forge all used a lot here since it gives me the most flexibility for recentering, and I've busted out my finest tense indicator for all of these setups. At this scale though, even the microscopic cutting grooves from the previous operation cause the needle to move about, so a thin piece of shim stock helps average out across the peaks of those cuts. Alright, let's poke some holes in this. First the smaller bores are drilled out within striking range, and then putting the big boy to work. All these shavings actually remind me of something. I haven't messed with my wife in a bit. Luckily I have the perfect opportunity with our returning sponsor, Henson Shaving. Last time, I massively geeked out over the precision machining Henson uses to make every one of their razors, but there's plenty of engineering to geek out about as well like the unique locating pins that better position the blade so I don't worry about cutting more than just my facial hair, the handle that threads against a wear-resistant Nitronic 60 bushing giving a smooth-as-butter feel, the wide-open channels that don't get clogged up with even the thickest of pelts, and the optimum cutting angle that's literally built right in so you can't get it wrong. But what I like most is that the blade is supported super close to the cutting edge, 
This means no blade flex and no annoying razor burn. The Henson AL-13 is a product that even noobs like me can use without it looking like a crime scene. Being entirely metal, it's not only a sustainably produced product, but will actually last a lifetime. And the blades have literally been around for 120 years, so it's cheap too, and will never become obsolete. Henson's technology is no secret. They tell you exactly how it works and why it's better. Anyone could make this razor, but no one does. So if you want to give it a shot, use code INHERITANCE at hensonshaving.com forward slash inheritance, or use the link in the description to get 100 free blade refills with your order. Thank you again, Henson, for the support and for another great shave. Now, let's see how the wife feels about it this time. You don't like the Hulk Hogan? I don't like the baby Hulk Hogan. <laughs> the baby Hulk baby Hogan? Baby Hulk Hogan. They're just very small. They're small? I might have made them too thin. It doesn't offend me as much as the other stash. Yeah, it's it's almost it's, more normal <laughs> somehow. I don't know if that would go that's, that far. That's, tell me what you want so I know what to aim away from. <laughs> 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 you just honked. <laughs> Don't hate it. I don't hate it. So I can wear it for more than a day. No. 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 I can't wear it to bed tonight. That, that needs to that needs to be reset so that we can go back to the nice full lumberjack. It needs to be reset. So you want me to shave everything? Okay. I'll come up with you. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> now for the boring part, and with everyone's favorite machinist pun out of the way, we can work on the insides. First opening everything else up to within the last 10th hour or so of the target dimensions. These bearing bores are going to be challenging because they need to be held to the tightest tolerances. My window is only a couple ten thousandths of an inch. This is small enough that even temperature has an effect. And considering I can't even touch the part, I'd better let it cool down and for good measure, recheck the run out. If these bores are off-center, the bearings will be off-center, and this whole live center will not be centered. Okay, I'm ready. The cuts are super light here, only a couple thou at a time, so deflection isn't a concern. But there's yet another thing to consider. My DRO is only accurate down to half a thousandth of an inch, not the tense accuracy I need. This is where my compound rest can come in handy. It's set to a shallow angle, so I can use it as a sort of fine adjust to really hone in on the diameter. And to keep track of the position, I'll just use the tense indicator. Man, nothing better than getting it right on the money. And with a beautiful surface finish to boot. The smaller bore is a similar story, just using a similarly small boring bar. Then the compound gets used for its true purpose of cutting the taper. And lastly, some aesthetics. Beautiferous. Let's cut the Morse taper on the other end. As I hope has become obvious by now from my continued emphasis, concentricity is critical here too. So I've removed as much material as possible on both the inside and outside. If things are going to warp, I want them to do so before I cut the final taper, not after. Unfortunately, the Morse standard is kind of a weirdo system, where the angle is slightly different from size to size. Lucky for me on the MT2, the angle I need is a nice round 1.4307. This turns out to be the same as a 25 thousandths rise per inch of hypotenuse. So I can make use of a couple indicators to dial this in perfectly. One on the compound itself to monitor the stroke, and then one along the side of the tailstock making sure the stem is square. Then it's just a matter of gently coercing it into position until I get the same rise over run numbers.
Last and most crucial step is to forget to start recording before cutting the actual taper. Luckily I realized before doing the whole thing. Feels like a pretty good fit to me, so that's the first part finished. And not a single hiccup. Let's see if I can keep that good luck rolling into this next one. The spindle. I'm changing materials here and going with some O1 tool steel. This will give me the option to harden like most live centers are, but I won't actually be doing that at this point. The difficulty with heat treating is that it turns straight parts into bananas. You can grind those bananas back into straight parts, but at the moment I have no cylindrical grinding equipment. So for now, no hardening. Sure, it's a bit of a cart before the horse situation, but I'm an excitable child, so we're gonna keep going. Okay, I've got some of the basic features turned on here, but before I start on the rest, I need to change my strategy. I'm almost certain as I start removing more material, this guy is going to warp. It's a small amount, but will matter in the end. So I'm going to turn this between centers. The advantage of turning between centers like this is that it doesn't prevent the part from bending how it wants to as material is removed and internal stresses are relieved. Every small bend from each pass is straightened out by the following pass, where if this is held on the chuck and tail stock, the part wouldn't be allowed to bend. Those changes would accumulate after each pass, and as soon as you let the part go, that bending would happen all at once, making that forbidden banana nobody wants. I've got this main section pretty close to the final diameter, but I wanted to point out something first. That rattling is actually because the part is shortened slightly as it cooled down. Not a big deal, just a good example of the importance of letting things cool before the final cuts. From here I'm keeping the passes super light so deflection and heat aren't issues. And again bumping out the small tailstock misalignments. Three for three on those critical fits. Let's knock out some of the less precise features now. Post project Brandon chiming in here. This is a fine example of not seeing the forest for the trees. To cut the taper, I had to set the compound like this, which meant I couldn't bring it in too close without hitting the tailstock. So I had to mount the tool way, way out in its holder just to reach the part. It works, albeit not the most rigid or convenient approach. But what anyone who thought about this for more than six seconds would have realized is I could have swung the compound around 180 degrees and not had this problem at all. Okay, I digress. One final diameter to take care of, and that's for the innermost needle bearing. Now of all the things I'm concerned about with not hardening this part, this is probably the biggest. The needle rollers are gonna be running directly on this surface. And this could go one of two ways. It could either wear out almost immediately, making this tool useless really fast, or the surface could work harden after just a few revolutions and wear would stop in its tracks. Again, I don't have grinding equipment, so only one way to find out. Last step for this setup is to drop some threads on here for the preload nut.
and back to the fore jaw to finish out the tip. All right, that's the two most difficult pieces by far. Let's finish this out with the hardware, starting with the lip seal retainer. Now, if I'm being honest, there's no functional reason to use bronze for this piece. This part serves no mechanical purpose other than holding the seal in place. But generally, when a build is looking a little boring, throwing a different material in the mix can add some pizzazz. Plus it also makes for a killer thumbnail, which if you made it this far means it was worth it. But it also means I get to take some honky chonky cuts. That takes care of the bore where the seal goes and the OD that presses into the body. But to finish this out, I'm going to need a buck. No, no, this isn't my way of asking for donations. I mean a buck, like a mandrel, something with a slightly snug fit to press this onto. There we go. Now I can finish out this end with the most important feature of all. Ain't she pretty? Okay, on to the rest. The bearings go onto the spindle, but because of their angular contact design, they won't be precise until they're preloaded against each other. So I'm going to need a narrow preload nut to go right here. I've drilled two different diameter holes in one end of this blank. The larger are a little bit bigger than the OD of the threads, and the smaller just long enough to make the actual nut. This gives threading tool runout clearance in the back for engaging and disengaging the feed while also giving a little bit of material for work holding. This is helpful not only on the lathe, but also over on the mill when cutting the wrench flats. Though I ended up not going through with all six because I realized I don't actually need them. And it also makes this a lot easier to hold on to for the final touches. Okie dokie, just one more piece at this point, the end cap for the body, which is basically a glorified screw, so just enjoy the chips. There you have it, the final piece of the puzzle. But it's a tad derpish, so I made a cooler one. Oh yeah, much better. I needed an excuse to feed the box of shame anyway. Okay, that's pretty much it for this build. 
The only thing left to do at this point is put it all together. If I did everything correctly, this should go pretty smoothly. First is to get some grease in these bearings. And as with most things on the internet, trying to find a solid answer on what to use here was about as fruitful as pushing a rope uphill. Everyone seems to have an opinion, and they're all different. So I just settled on some readily available lithium grease. Warming the bearings up should expand them slightly helping with assembly, so I'll set these over on the wood stove. And I'll do the same for the body. In the meantime, I'll get the spindle mounted in a collet block, and then put this in the freezer to shrink it a bit. The seal just presses into the bronze sleeve. Now that things are sufficiently warmed and cooled, everything should just slide together. Or not. I'm guessing I either got the temperature differential wrong, or I botched the interference right from the start. Whatever the case, I don't think I'm going to be getting this back apart anytime soon. At least not without scrapping something. Over on the lathe, I turned up a simple tool for inserting the needle bearing. And after torching the body a little bit to properly heat it up, the bearing slides right in place. As did the rest of the assembly, which I masterfully neglected to record. But I basically just used the lathe again to press them together. And naturally, it was the smoothest part of the assembly by far. But you'll just have to take my word for it. Anyway, the life center is now finished and ready for the most important part. Getting those thumbnail pictures before I mess anything up. Okay, I'm kidding. Let's see how it turned out. Over to the lathe. Why? Well, I was expecting a small amount of run out, maybe a tenth or two. But a thou and a half? What the hell? Out of curiosity, I did the same measurement on my other live center, and yep, I think I'm going to be sick. This is the center I used for this whole project. No wonder nothing is straight. But wait, it gets better. The new live center is also about as rigid as a wet noodle. The movement doesn't seem to be coming from the bearings themselves, which is a huge relief. Nor is the tailstock moving, also good. It's all in the body, so there must be something going on at the Morse taper. It could just be that the angle is slightly off. But feeling inside here, I think I know the problem. There are all kinds of nicks and divots and grooves preventing things from seating correctly. They're also marring up my beautiful live center. So it seems I've got some issues to fix on both this live center and now the tailstock. Oh, and apparently my other live centers as well. It might be time to bite the bullet and get some cylindrical grinding capabilities in this shop. But that's a huge topic, and it's going to have to wait for another video. I don't want to leave this off on a low note, though. So let's at least make some test cuts with this new live center. Well, that actually worked all right. It almost makes you forget the fact that this is a big stinking turd. But unlike most turds, I'm convinced this one can actually be polished. It may just end up pushing my budget a bit closer to that thousand dollars I set out to save to begin with. I guess the moral of the story is, there are no shortcuts. As always, thanks for watching, and see you next time. To be resets. So you want me to shave everything, even my ass. <laughs> you know, what part of the problem is when you smile, it becomes a trapezoid. <laughs> <laughs> it's like very clear when I'm smiling. There's no doubt when I'm smiling because <laughs> I become a quadrilateral. No, you are a quadrilateral. Is it a trapezoid? That's a quadrilateral. Yeah, I become more quadrilaterally. No, that's not how that works. I can become a parallelogram. But... <laughs>
I think the, the conclusion we're coming to here is that, that more facial hair is better. Oh. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Look at this and then turn it sideways. Oh, God. <laughs> it makes you, like, fat.